Good morning. I'm Theodore Roosevelt. One day, the White House gang found their way onto the roof of the White House after a heavy snow. There were great drifts on the inside gutters. The gang mushed trails, slipped and slid and fell and divided up for pitched snowball battles. From this height, it was the gang's special delight to drop large snowballs, the center of which contained old electric light bulbs. This could be done only on rare occasions. Great strategy was needed to get the bulbs. Also, the excitement it caused among the White House staff took time to abate. For when the bulb struck the concrete in the areaways, they caused loud pops, which reverberated as sharply as pistol shots. Policemen, secret servicemen, and attendants came on the run from all directions. On a particular Saturday, the gang made snowballs without the electric light bulbs. The gang packed big snowballs on the level walkway of the roof and rolled them off. By buzzard, Quentin cried. Something's got to be done with this one. It's too good to waste. He put his head out between the side balustrades of the porte cochere and looked down. Then he withdrew it and gestured to the gang. The boys looked over the edge of the cornice and could see the figure of a policeman far below. He was standing like a statue on a fixed post, a few feet from the center columns of the porte cochere. He was facing it with the greatest, and to the boys, the most unreasonable solemnity. At his right, the carriage drive went under the porte cochere. At his left, the steps led up to the main entrance. I'm not sure, Quentin said, but I think that's John Jamerson. Well, no matter. Even if it is Jamerson, I can't help it. So with a single thought and a united effort, the gang rolled the snowball, big enough now for the body of a snowman. They rolled it along the inside of the balustrade. With tremendous exertion, accompanied by much grunting, five small boys managed to get the enormous ball of snow up on the wide shelf of the balustrade. It wobbled there perilously for a moment, and then of its own weight decided to balance there. Quinton, held upright by members of the White House gang cradling his feet, placed himself directly behind the snowball. Then he gave it a vigorous push to propel it over and beyond the projecting cornice. Gravity did the rest. Their aim could not fail. It was a straight down drop, and the huge snowball landed directly on top of the policeman's helmet and broke it into fragments. The officer sat down upon the pavement suddenly and with pronounced finality. His crushed helmet rolled into the gutter of the driveway. His hands clutched at the snow piled about him. The gang drew in their heads from the balustrade, hugging themselves and weeping with joy. They had attained the paramount peak of ambition known to the boys world over. They had flattened a cop. <sighs> but below, under the porte cochere, something else was happening. The presidential carriage was there. At the moment, I had been entering the carriage when the great snowball crashed down not 15 feet away from me. The horses jumped and lunged. The coachman stood up and pulling on the reins with all his strength was able to hold them in. The footman clutched at me. Members of my staff at the door leaped forward and interposed themselves between myself and the pavement to save me from falling under the hoof or the wheel. The gang had its first hint of all this when I rushed from under the porte cochere to assist the day's policeman to his feet. Then I turned with blazing eyes in the direction of the balustrade and I shook my fist vigorously. Then in a voice that must have been heard as far east as the treasury building, and as far west as the State War Navy building, I cried out, You! You! Come down from that roof at once! Then turning to the staff, I said, Go and catch them. By George, let not one of them escape. Bring them to me. Father, Quinton called from above. Father! Yes, I responded. Of course, it's Quinton. Quinton. I want to explain, Quinton went on. No explanation received or considered from that height, young man, I returned. Come down here. When the gang appeared before me, they were amazed to find that I was not furiously angry. Well, I began, it's fortunate for you that you haven't broken his neck, as might have been expected. I'm darn glad, I'll say, remarked Brom with obvious sincerity. 
That's good, said Dick. We didn't think of that, sir, honestly, Charlie explained. Father, I'll pay for his helmet out of my allowance, Quentin offered with eagerness. Don't becloud the issue, I interrupted. Such side concerns are virtually irrelevant. You haven't hurt the officer, luckily, but by George, you've done something quite as reprehensible. You've hurt his dignity in front of me. That policeman had just started to salute when your enormous snowball descended upon him out of the unknown. Think of his amazement. Think of the shock. Think of the humiliation. Think of his chagrin, finding himself upon the pavement before me, covered with snow. Think of his feelings. He saw that I saw the whole business from beginning to end. He saw even that I laughed. I shouldn't have done so, I know, of course. But how could I help it? It made me laugh, but it was terrible. Now, please understand this. Never do anything calculate to hurt another person's dignity unless, unless you are sure that beyond the shadow of a doubt, his dignity is utterly false and foolish. Even then, look well to yourselves first and try to discover what superior claim you have to expose his or anyone else's silliness. If you do, you will never do it again. This policeman, as I happen to know, has a long and honorable record. His post is a place of honor and responsibility. At this moment, though, he is not so proud of it. He cannot help but watch out of the corner of his eye for another avalanche from the roof. Therefore, until he is assured that nothing of this kind will ever occur again, he is not as good a presidential guard as he should be, or as he desires to be. Each of you, beginning with Quinton, will apologize separately, and as well as you are able, to this officer. But now, however, immediately, just to carry out my orders, you are not to go into session and talk about the things I have said to you among yourselves. If you do not agree, you will come to me and explain clearly and distinctly just where and why you do not agree. We will then proceed to a reconsideration of the whole matter. If, however, you decide it must be a matter for no further argument, and that is my suggestion, you will go to this policeman in just that spirit, knowing that you should do it, and tender him an apology, not perfunctorily offered, but handsomely and with real sincerity. Thank you, Mr. President, little Walker White boomed in his resonant voice. You're quite welcome, sir, I responded, and I walked away slowly to the carriage. There was hardly any discussion among the members of the gang regarding the justice or equity of my orders. Within a quarter of an hour, they had apologized individually and collectively to the policeman, who before it was over became quite embarrassed by the boy's sincerity and the difficulty he found in adequately meeting the flood of the apology.